afternoon and welcome to Tuesdays in the Chapel. My name is Keith Belton. I'm the Director of Marketing and Development here. And I'm thankful that you've taken this time for midweek break at Scarrett Bennett Center. Oh, give thanks to God who is good, whose steadfast love endures forever. We thank you, God, for your steadfast love, for your wonderful works to humankind, for you satisfy the thirsty and fill the hungry with good things. Fill our hearts with wisdom that we may ponder the majesty of your loving deeds. God, confront us in this time of worship. Confront us with the fears we hold so tightly, the favorite sins to which we cling. Confront us with our closeness. Knock at all the locked doors of our hearts. Do not let us rest until you gain entrance. Tell us the painful truth about ourselves that we might receive the truth of Christ, the very, tr very truth that will set us free. Amen. We'll take a moment for silent prayer and meditation. Amen. Before I read James chapter 3, I'd like to introduce our pastor bringing a message today. I'll turn. Hayes, Pastor Hayes, we appreciate you coming. You've come before and you've always brought a good message and we look forward to hearing from you today. Pastor Hayes is a current pastor and servant leader at United at Unity Missionary Baptist Church here in Nashville. He holds an undergraduate degree from Tennessee State University and he's used that as an educator both in private and metro city schools. He earned his Master's of Divinity as a graduate from Lipscomb University. He's currently a tenured member of the Board of Directors for Sedine Bible Camp and Conference Center in Spring City, Tennessee. Pastor Hayes has gained invaluable experience in all facets of ministry opportunities from youth to music to outreach, prison, and benevolence. He is known for his unique way of delivering God's word, and we'll hear that today. He and his wife, Victoria Hayes, are blessed with five children, a son-in-law, and one grandchild. So you're busy running around, I'm sure. So with that, we look forward to hearing your word in a moment. Not many of you become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For those of us who make many mistakes, anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by the very small rudder whatever the will of the power directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire and the tongue of a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It strains the whole body, sets the fire, the circle of nature, and itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth that blessings and cursings, my brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life and by your good works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be boastful or false to the truth. 
Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritually, and devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is also a disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in the peace for those who make peace. Amen. Say good afternoon. It's a blessing to be here once again. Title for uh, today's uh, message is Watch Your Mouth. James chapter 3, the entire uh, chapter, so to speak. Watch your mouth. When someone says something we don't like or are on the verge of saying something so true or so heavy for us to bear, why do we say, watch your mouth? Why do we say this knowing that it is practically a physical impossibility unless one is looking into a mirror? I'm glad you asked. The Apostle James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, reminds us in the first chapter of his general epistle written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad that the Word of God is just that, a mirror, wherein we can see ourselves as well as others. In James chapter 1, verse 23 through 26. Uh, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. So then James who was once among those who did not believe Jesus, his own brother, was the Messiah, according to Mark chapter 3, verse 20, and chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, came to know something about watching his own mouth, becoming an authority on eating crow. He became a believer sometime after the resurrection of Jesus. He talked with Paul in Jerusalem after Paul's conversion, Galatians 1, 18 and 19. He became a church leader in the council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 and believed to be the primary leader there after Paul's third missionary journey. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, he was condemned by the Sanhedrin and high priest and ultimately being stoned to death for his faith in who he first did not believe was the Messiah, his own brother. Yes, this man, James, who can say, can say to us, watch your mouth. James' message as a whole teaches his readers practical, pragmatic, and moral ethics of life. Who here has not been told, if you can't say anything good, Don't say anything at all. Today, people are advised to say whatever comes to mind, whether good or bad, right or wrong, true or fake news. Biblically speaking, however, good means what is true and right. James is writing in a time in the early church when there was liberality to speak openly in the synagogue, which nurtured some disorderly confusion. Some would teach without proper preparation or exegesis as called in theological circles, simply meaning not having one's facts right for the right reasons. Some were teaching to gain notoriety for themselves. James, however, speaks to the issues of accountability and responsibility with our words. With this we know that not only can sticks and stones break our bones, but if we ask those being bullied and verbally abused, we find that words can definitely hurt us and even assassinate our character. 
Therefore, James illustrates with bits in the mouths of horses to control their bodies and small rudders directing great ships to express the power of this little member we call the tongue. James was saying, we can watch our mouths if we really want to. Horses often struggle against the bridle until tamed. I once rode a trail horse at Sedan uh, in Spring City named Surprise, unbeknownst to me until after the ride was over. The horse followed the lead horse until it got into an open field where it decided to run full steam ahead, refusing to slow down no matter how hard I pulled on the reins until it came to an overhang where she stopped suddenly, almost throwing me off. Then she slowly gathered herself and walked down the embankment with me, clinging on as I prayed for my peace to return. Surprise was showing me that she could not so easily be control. James says this is like the tongue which is dangerous if not under control. We all too often excuse our loose lips even though we've heard they do what? Sink ships. Rather than provide safe navigation. James says our tongues can be like wildfire burning out of control. Oh, they know something about that out in California. They know something out there in the West right now. Even the fire of hell itself, and that's hot. Circuses and zoos captivate us because they exhibit wild animals in a state of control or submission. My nephew, now grown, was taken to the zoo as a small boy. He was so excited about going uh, so much so that he talked about it every day. He talked about what he was going to do to that old bear. And he, we asked, he said, I'm going to knock that old bear out. I'm going to punch that old bear in the mouth. Uh, were things he would say until he got to the bear exhibit and saw the actual size of the bear. And when asked what he was going to do to that old bear, looking at the bear, he simply said, I ain't doing nothing to that big old bear. It was a case of the old cliche of letting his mouth or tongue write a check that his little behind couldn't cash. I personally uh, had opportunity to go on safari in Botswana, Africa uh, this past year. Uh, we saw regal and majestic animals in their natural habitats. Uh, it began to look like a storm, uh, but I had not seen a lion yet. And I proclaimed very loudly for the group we were with, I'm not going back to America until I see a lion. Just as we had to leave, a lioness was spotted by one of the other uh, 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 guards, one of the other uh, guides. And he called us and told us. And our guide got on the, on the spot and we rushed across to see this lioness. And when he got there, he stopped the Jeep and turned off the ignition. I was thrilled to see the animal, but I was not so glad that the engine was turned off. Just in case she wasn't having a good day or saw us as an easy kill as she sat and licked her lips within feet from where we were. I know she was not tame or timid, so anything could happen. This is James' point. With the untamed tongue, anything could and can happen. We often say things and say, I wasn't thinking, which is a physiological impossibility. One must think to speak. Watch your mouths. Once words are gone out, they will fulfill their purpose. Proverbs 18, 21 relays to us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. We can either speak life and love, or we can speak death and hatred into the atmosphere. With so much negativity and division in the world, we must become accountable 
and responsible and intentional with our words because they develop or destroy, and that's our choice. The latter part of James chapter 3 speaks to the integrity of the wise man or woman who does not speak out of both sides of their mouth, nor from the side of their neck. You remember that song? James early reported that double-minded people are unstable in all their ways in chapter 1, verse 8. The wise believer, however, is consistent and speaks with pure wisdom revealed from God. This kind of wisdom and speech dispels confusion. David said in Psalm 39, verses 1 and 2, I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace, even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. There are some times we must learn to hold our peace or simply be quiet, or people will soon know how little we really know. It baffles me that we politicize matters of health and well-being of our kids and our schools and the lives of people around the world. It baffles me further that we, as James would agree, cannot seem to speak without partiality or hypocrisy because of party lines and affiliations. We appear to thrive off of the confusion set in order in large part by the mouths of our elected officials, both past and present. We live in the age of unapologetic apologies and written statements to cover legalities. It would be so much better if we would simply watch our mouths. And what we say in the truest sense of the word, the psalmist of Psalm 141 set the bar by asking the Lord, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the doors of my lips. The sentiment illustrates an armed guard at the doors of one's mouth, allowing only the passage of what is true and right. Wouldn't that be something? You ever seen the movie Liar, Liar? That's what it reminds me of. Couldn't tell a lie. We should rehearse the words of Psalm 19, verse 14, in closing. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength, my redeemer. Please, everyone, watch your mouth. Amen. Pastor Hayes, thank you for those words of wisdom. If you will join me in our hymn of response, it is Breathe on Me, Breath of God. It is number 420 in your hymnal.
holy God, blessed and wise, you teach us the wisdom of love and the blessings of merciful grace. Grant us teachable spirits that we may remain loyal to you, courage that we may risk acts of justice, and dignity that we may recognize your image in all people, and so bring honor to the name of Christ. In those whose names we pray, amen.